What I want you to do is take your chairs and put them toward the outside of all these tables. Scoot the tables a little bit to the middle. Leave your teammates. Sit somewhere else. And we're going to make this a big kind of U around the outside. Scoot things in. I'm Drew again. Ellie is Ellie again. We're not playing the game anymore. So, um, and I want to summarize and then have us consider this scenario before we start talking about what this means. And what you just did is created a scenario that had very a wide range of actions that you took. Noticing taxing coal, subsidizing renewables. In this case, you help gas along, even though that didn't help you very much, it didn't help you very much. A relatively hard, high carbon price, focusing on energy efficiency, and some technologies that lowered the demand. The result, oh, a lot with reducing deforestation, growing more trees, reducing uh, food uh, emissions, some technological carbon removal. Some of the result that you see is that we would be peaking coal first, 2025, Gas a little bit later in the 2040s. Oil here in 2030 would be peak oil with a growth of zero carbon renewable energy. Just for a moment, consider the possibility that this could happen. There's a lot in our culture that says there's no way this could happen. And most of the conversation around this issue is around that. So for just 60 seconds, we, these 35 people together, are going to just be silent and consider the possibility that we could prevent this problem into the future. Think about what you would love about that actually happening. We're going to be silent for 60 seconds. Okay. Turn to the person next to you or two people next to you. Tell them how you are feeling at this moment after this experience. This is not what you're thinking. This is, are you mad? Are you sad? Are you glad? Are you scared? Are you hopeful? Mad, sad, glad, scared. Turn to the person next to you. How are you feeling? <laughs> and? I'm going to wrap up your conversation with the person next to you. OK, and I'm curious, just um, quick reflections that came up in the 60 seconds of silence or even just this brief kind of checking in with your neighbor? It made us hopeful and it, the idea of less greed and competition and more global harmony is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have some positive feels over here. Yeah. We had some mixed feels. We talked about like, we're cool, like this world sounds good. It's one with more forests, more efficient buildings and all that, but like, the thought of all the coordination and people coming together that would it require makes us nervous. <laughs> and it's still only at two, you know. Yeah, that right. Doesn't mean that just means like we aren't all going to die like all <laughs> at once. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, other reflections here? I'm also curious. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious as to, you know, what would happen if we had done things in a different order, would we have gotten to a different result? And I'm curious whether um, what it would take to get to 1.5. Well, that's enough of a practical question, and maybe this is the next place to go. So we talked about a little bit how you're feeling as human beings who are in the middle of this. Let's just put that aside for a second. And there were a lot of things that we asserted up here based on our research and this modeling that you just like had to kind of accept. <laughs> like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. Electric cars? I thought that was going to save everything. And it, so I want to like, let's just now talk about some of the things that you saw that may have been different from what you really expected and things like, wait, what about 1.5? And we only got two degrees. That's, that's kind of disappointing that we weren't able to, you know, we did all of these things and we didn't meet this goal that, uh, 1.5 to stay alive is what all the young people were chanting at Katowice when I was there a couple months ago at the UN negotiations. It's a big goal that we do have. So basically, let's, let's push it. So call out, what, what would it take to get to 1.5? And there was a report, by the way, that we contributed three scenarios to that had dozens of models that answered exactly this question. And it's pretty consistent with what we're about to show you. So call out, what do you think it would take? Maximize biochar. 
So more technological carbon removal could ease us down another point one. Yeah, so it's got to be methane, coal, oil, and gas. Like that's where the sources of this are. So we can reduce this, but it's not even methane can't do that much more. It's basically, well, we're burning gas throughout. Like we can't burn fossil fuels. <laughs> we need to totally eliminate them. Like, it is a pollution that uh, is killing us. So it's that. There it is. So what do you do? You, first of all, get rid of the tax of the subsidy, and then you start to tax it. And that's probably going to happen via fracking regulation, and et cetera. And you start to tax oil and or you boost up this carbon price to some of these. What are we at now? $123 a ton? You've heard like just incredibly high levels. You can do other things like, you know, push coal down some more. We can go and make it retire uh, even faster. So less coal, um, right here. Coal plant accelerated retirement. Asheville was successful a couple years ago, shutting down its coal-fired power plant around here. And so there you are. What does it take? Peaking coal, oil, and gas within the next five or 10 years and dropping them suddenly over time. Over and then where do we get our energy? We get it from our use of renewables. And it's important, we haven't shown it that much, but what does energy use do globally? What do you guess? What is it going to show? It's going to go way down. Right? We're just going to not use all this energy. We have to reduce our demand for it. And so that's going to take lifestyle changes. That's going to take policy changes to encourage much more efficient use. Yeah, so and, and I'll also add, too, that it's really important as we think about something like the, a very high carbon price and taxes on fossil fuels and things like uh, lowered energy demand, like play that out in your head, too, and think about how that looks. For some people, if the policies are not designed in a very thoughtful and deliberate way that is keeping in mind the fact that high energy prices really hurt poor people, uh, those policies, if designed uh, without that kind of careful lens towards people's needs, can do harm as well. Um, so, you know, the model simplifies a lot, um, and the way these policies are discussed has to be done with nuance and has to hold the fact that there are lots of competing needs, competing human needs uh, in this equation that are unable to be ignored. And in the same way, there's huge potential for co-benefits in the near term, particularly to our most vulnerable people. Imagine a world where coal dropped that much that fast. I just saw a statistic today that coal has been reducing the average lifetime of a European two years. Anyone see this in the, come across their news today? It's taking two years off the average European. Now you imagine a poor person in Detroit who's breathing a lot of that coal and it's even more. So this is a world that's much healthier. This is a world with lower health costs and many other benefits because we take, we can appreciate what happens in the near term because of many of these policies. That's an important thing to note. That's, that's right because where are, when we think of the forests of the world, where are they? Brazil, Indonesia, um, that's where there is huge amounts of deforestation. Um, so stopping that deforestation requires action in those places. Um, and in addition to that, afforestation, when we talk about planting trees, we're not talking about the, the, the potential to plant massive forests across Europe isn't there because it's way too densely developed. Uh, same thing with uh, some sections of the United States. We have the, you know, and this afforestation um, lever is challenging. The scale at which we're talking about planting trees is huge. And again, this is one of these uh, kind of things that, lo that is loaded. Um, we can't just say, oh, we're going to plant trees. There have been massive tree planting programs before, and they've flopped. Um, they can sometimes uh, be planting monocultures. So we need to make sure if we're planting trees, that it's done in such a way that is uh, 
in tune with the, the, the ecology and the, the local ecosystem. And so with that, again, uh, it goes back to the details of how these policies are actually implemented. Uh, but it's a good point. What if we back them out? Let's test that uh, and see. We're, we're at 1.5 right now. Um, if we back out and we say, okay, we're not doing so much tree planting, uh, there's still some deforestation out there. So, and then over, and then how much was that, that population? Um, do you all remember? What do you think it is? It was a... How much, do you remember how much it, it gained us? It was a tenth of a degree, I think. Tenth of no, it was a tenth of a degree. One point, we were at 1.5, and now we're at 1.6. Again, slower economic growth. This is GDP per capita rising at 1.7% a year instead of 2.7. So much slower growth is another part of silver buckshot. It is not going to solve the problem entirely if you just slow it down. But it's important. What, what you're talking about is it's a very hot button issue, particularly with population. You notice how we say empower women and girls because 20 years ago there was a huge movement of Western NGOs going over and saying the problem, and these are a bunch of tall white guys like me going and talking to largely brown-skinned people who are poor saying, you need to stop having more baby. And like, this is not how the transformation is gonna happen. Um, it's a very sensitive issue that we need to handle really carefully. We need a long-term supply of energy. Like, you'll notice like, we don't need renewable energy. We don't need wind and solar. We need for climate to stop burning coal, oil, and gas. So things that keep coal, oil, and gas safely in the ground help us. A solar panel doesn't help directly at a global scale anything unless it succeeds at displacing coal, oil, and gas. So it could be renewables that are here. It also, and personally I'm not a big fan of this, but it could be there's nuclear, and some people have the vision that that's how we do it. Um, or this new nu nuclear, some zero carbon thorium vision. They can compete, they could all be together, they have different costs. Lithium ion batteries are not without cost, and photovoltaics, you know, you still have to manufacture them, there are a lot of nasty chemicals. Uh, not as nasty as radioactive uranium or thorium, but, um, so they, they tend to play off each other. We want to shift just a little bit. Um, there was a discussion earlier about how we could actually do this and whether it could be possible to make this happen. And I'd like you all to consider whether we could actually see a scenario like we just talked about, where there was a climate emergency summit and we took action. This, I think, is really relevant to what we could be in the middle of today in the world. This is a graph, it goes from 1800 all the way just to 2015, so it stops a few years ago. And each little notch here is a state adopting a new law that eventually became a national amendment to the Constitution. So way back here, Loving versus Virginia, interracial marriage, only a few states had it. There were people fighting for interracial marriage in 1780 who for the next 60 years, years, they and their children and their protégés fought without any success for 60 years. They got a few more, they got a few more, 1870s up to 1900, they kept at it, they kept at it, they kept at it, and then whew, this exponential growth of finally the world coming to believe that this made sense and Loving versus Virginia in 1967, boom, it's a national amendment. Saying this is here with Prohibition, boom, here is uh, the women's right to vote. These folks, this is another, like, what is it, no, 10 years of w trying to say that women should be able to vote, takes over, and then in 1920, the 19th Amendment. Here's Roe v. Wade in 1973. Here is um, same-sex marriage. We saw this, and this got to 36 states at the time of the graph. Here is... Uh, recreational marijuana, which is about to just take that same kind of leap. The thing I want you to see is the shape. It looks like nothing is happening until everything is happening. It looks like nothing is happening until everything is happening. 
And I'd like you to consider the possibility that in this movement, we are right there.